My family owns a funeral home. When I tell people this, I usually get one of two questions. Is it haunted? Or is it creepy working there? To the first question, no. Even though the house itself is old, it was built in the 1860s and bought by my great-grandfather in 1886. None of us have seen or heard anything specially unusual. In 2009, my dad was contacted by a producer of one of those ghost hunting TV shows because they heard rumors that it was haunted. My dad laughed, told the producers that they were more than welcome to stop by, but he was sure nothing would happen. They didn't end up visiting. But there is an article about it floating around on the internet. I think of it like the funeral home being a liminal space. We're here on the descendants' way between places. It doesn't make more sense to haunt a place they have no emotional connection to, right? To the second question, sometimes. Now, by the time I was born, the house had been completely turned into a funeral home, and my family lived in the house behind it. But for all intents and purposes, I did grow up there. Both my parents work as funeral directors, my oldest sister is a state-licensed deserologist, and my older brother is studying mortuary science, and I help out in the office and around the home, even though I'm not going to be in the business. This is all to say that we've all grown up in proximity to the funeral home, and I think every single one of us can say that while it isn't haunted, it can be creepy. Sometimes you hear the dead groan when gases release. Sometimes their bodies move due to muscles tensing and relaxing as they go through the stages of death. Occasionally, the descendant died in an incident that causes traumatic damage, and that ends up causing nightmares. We've taken care of people who died in all stages of life, the very young to the very old. And once in a while, a grieving family member or friend has a violent outburst. For us, this is just standard operating procedure. But every now and again, something happens that's truly creepy. Usually this happens due to the like wake. My great-great-grandfather was an undertaker in Yorkshire, England. When he came to the United States, he brought a few traditions with him, which he included in the operations of the funeral home. One of these was a kind of old-school wake. Regular wakes are the usual gatherings that you're probably used to, and some people use visitation and wake to mean the same thing. The like wake is a vigil that lasts all night. There are still cultures that do this, staying the night with a body to keep watch or pray. It's fallen out of fashion in modern times, but in my great-great-grandfather's will, he mandated that we should offer it as part of our service for as long as the funeral home continues to operate. I have no idea why he was so adamant on it, although one family story is that he said something like, The people who ask for it are the ones who need it the most. So we offer it. It's on our list of services, along with the FTC's funeral checklist. My family's always been very upfront about costs. I could go on for hours about how messy and corrupt the funeral industry can be, but you're not here for that. And the, the like wake is always a complimentary service. You only know about it if you ask. Here's how our booklet defines it. A vigil held after hours in the home, able to be attended by family members or friends with permission. Funeral home's name, directors, and associates can also participate as a proxy or otherwise as needed. Like wakes can be held up to 7 o'clock in the morning when the funeral home's operating hours begin. People have asked us what the like wake is good for, and we usually tell them that it gives people extra time to say goodbye, provide solitudes, or just assure friends and family that the, the descendant is not alone in the house. Theft of valuables like jewelry is a concern for some people, so this little extra assurance can be comforting. Not many people take us up on it. Those that do sometimes ask us to hold it as proxies, or just for the aforementioned assurance. Sometimes two or three of us do it, sometimes it's just one. A few months ago, it was just me. The descendant's sister had requested the like wake for her brother, asking for it to be held until operating hours again. For the sake of his privacy, I'll just say that he was, um, he was in his late 20s when he died, and... While he'd been killed in an accident, the damage wasn't visible on his head or hands. 
His sister said that she'd had some pretty disturbing dreams about his death, where he was in the casket with his eyes closed, but his body was moving restlessly. She insisted that she wasn't superstitious, but something about the dreams worried her. We held the man's like wake in the night between the visitation and the funeral itself. The last visitor left around 9.30 in the evening, leaving just the descendant's parents and sister. Before they left together, his sister came up to me and my mom and asked if she could leave an envelope in her brother's casket and to place his cell phone in his pocket. She said that she felt weird having it. We told her she was more than welcome to do so. It only took her about a minute. And when she came back, she pulled me aside. If anything happens tonight, will you tell me when I come back in the morning? She asked. I was confused, but I said I absolutely would. Honestly, people have asked me weirder things. The family left, and my mom and I made all the preparations for the like wake. It's not as ritualistic as it sounds. We light a candle in the same room as the casket, do our basic cleanup, fill any requests the family might have. Most of the time, it's to play certain songs or leave a uh, particular food or drink out for them. And one family asked us to read letters out loud to the deceased, some of which were incredibly funny. So in this man's case, we put a bottle of pale ale, two Twix bars, and a poetry anthology book on the table beside the casket. But once it was done, I settled on the couch in the office for the night while my mom went home. Our rules for the like wake are pretty simple. I'd stay all night, catnapping if I had to, with alarms set every hour and a half so I would get up and go into the viewing area to make sure the candle was still lit and everything was in its proper place. Honestly, a funeral home at night isn't as scary as you might think. I kept the lights on in the office and main hallway, and I'm so used to being in that house that very few noises alarm me. However, around one o'clock in the morning, I heard two loud knocks. Like someone banging their fist against a door. Now this like wake didn't have any scheduled visitors, so we kept the front and back doors locked. That, and I, I couldn't actually discern where the knocking came from. I looked at our security camera feed and didn't see anyone at either door. I wondered if something fell down upstairs. It's an old house, you know, so what happens. I went upstairs. Nothing. Everything was exactly where it should be. When I came back down the stairs, I heard it again. It was just as loud and insistent, if not more so, just, just two heavy knocks coming from nowhere. I'm not scared of the house, but I, I was scared of something. I went down the hallway, and on a whim, I looked into the viewing area. Nothing was out of place there either, including the candle. For a few minutes, I stood there waiting for something to happen. It was quiet. Then two loud knocks from nowhere, followed by what sounded like every door in the house being knocked on twice. I mean, front door, back door, side door, office door, all the doors upstairs. I like to think I'm brave, but I absolutely did scream before running back into the office. I thought about calling my mom and dad, but something kept me from getting my phone. I don't know if it was just, if I was just so scared, I, I wasn't thinking straight or what, but I didn't contact anyone. It was quiet after that. I spent most of the next hour and a half trying to logically reason out what would have caused the knocks. And by the time I came to a conclusion, old house noises, ad nauseum, my alarm went off to go check the viewing area at 2.30. Reluctantly, I went. Candle was lit. Everything was fine. Except the man's cell phone was going off. So in the amount of time I stood there, his phone never stopped vibrating for, for 10 minutes. It, it may have gone on for longer, but I, I didn't stay around to find out. Four o'clock, quiet. I was messaging my friend on Discord by this point and saying, thank God at that. And then came the 5.30 check. Naturally, I was exhausted. I hadn't slept. Half the time between 4 and 5.30, I was all tense and... Waiting for that knocking to come back, I dragged myself into the viewing area and I saw that the bottle of beer, the Twix bars, and the book were on the floor. The bottle was upright. Twix bars were still beside each other, not even like they'd fallen, but more like someone had picked them up 
off the display exactly as they were and place them on the floor like that. Then the candle was out. Don't ask me why, but the candle being out scared me more than the stuff on the floor. I turned around to go back to the office and get the lighter when I swear, I, I, I swear, I saw the body in the casket sit up and look at me. It was totally dark, except for the light in the hallway and the emergency exit lighting at the back of the room, but that was enough to make out the silhouette and the red light reflecting off his eyes. The thing is, my oldest sister put caps over his eyeballs and glued them shut to make sure that they kept the shape and didn't sink. His eyes were wide open. I ran back to the office faster than I'd ever run in my life. There is such a thing as being too scared to scream. So I just, I sat in the locked room, huddled up in a corner, wondering what the hell was happening. I wanted to call my mom, but the phone was on the other side of the room. And for some reason, I was too afraid to get up and grab it. I must, I must have been there for an hour before it happened too. Two loud knocks on the office door and then... Silence. Then my phone buzzed. I forced myself to get up, even though I was I was dreading every step. I took my phone off the charger. Everything okay? From my mom, it was it was from my mom. I I almost cried in relief. I texted her back and I asked her if she could come over earlier, although I didn't say why. She said she'd be over in a few minutes. Those next few minutes were some of the longest in my life. In all my sleep-deprived fear, I was expecting to hear my mom come in and scream. Instead, I heard her come in, heard the door handle jiggle, and then she texted me why the office door was locked. I let her in, and I, 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 I absolutely did cry and hug her. I told her everything that happened, including the part about the, the candle going out and the body sitting up. She comforted me and then said, but everything's fine in there. When I looked over her shoulder into the viewing area, I saw that the candle was lit. And the bottle, the Twix bars, the book, they were back on the table. My mom thought I might have had a nightmare, and in my desperation for things to make sense, I agreed with her. Even so, I sat in the office while she started all the opening procedures. She said I could go home, but honestly, I just I wanted to be around her for a little bit longer. At 8 o'clock, the family started coming in including the descendant's sister. She saw me. I, I don't want to know what she thought. I was in a hoodie and sweatpants and looked absolutely frazzled, and she waved me over. She asked how the night had gone, if anything had happened. I mentioned the knocking and the phone going off. Everything except for the body sitting up. She immediately started crying. She didn't explain. Instead, she went into the viewing area for a minute and came back with the envelope and the phone. Still crying, she held the envelope like it was the most precious thing in the world. Before he died, I got in a fight with him over something really stupid, she told me. I never got the chance to apologize. This is an apology letter. And I don't know why, but I feel like I had to write. At this, she opened the envelope, unfolded the letter, and showed me the bottom of it. If you accept my apology, one knock for no, two knocks for yes. I can't describe to you how I felt at that moment. All that knocking, all and those two knocks at the end of the night, just yes, 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 yes. And then she showed me the call history on his phone. There's enough times that she had to scroll down for calls from his work. This is actually my phone, she said. She started crying again, still scrolling through the calls. The day he died, he called me from his work phone. I was still mad at him, so I didn't pick up. And when I called him back, he didn't answer. The thing is, after everything that happened, his sister seemed relieved rather than scared and thanked me for staying with him. 
After that, I went home and I thought about what my great-great-grandfather had said and the people who ask for like wakes. They're the ones who need it the most. They need more closure than a regular funeral can provide. Hey there, kids, and happy Halloween. It's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I wanted to tell you thank you so much for watching tonight's video, or listening to tonight's episode, This October Fest, on the podcast. If you're not listening on the podcast, then you always can listen on the podcast at Spotify, or just about anywhere you find a podcast. And if you're not listening on YouTube, then you can find it on YouTube, or just about anywhere you find a YouTube. If any of you guys are interested in some of the audiobooks or actual books that have horror stories in them that I've worked on, you can always check out that description down below. In there, there's a couple of different links to some horror books and horror audiobooks and new things, like hopefully there'll be a Tales from the Gas Station Volume 3 link down there in the next few days, which I'm referring to right now, because if you look and it's out, it'll be there. <laughs> also, I wanted to say thank you, all of you who are supporting me on Patreon. It's patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta. If you ever want to help support the show, keep the lights on, feed my cats and the like, you can always head over to patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta, and you can support the show there. Even $1 is greatly appreciated. And I have a very special thank you to these guys, such as Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Mr. Thud, Ken Lando Higuchi, Chumpinski, Nico Kayo, Tristan Pelton, Stephen Van Hus, Chance Burnett, Deanna Krauss, G. Weevil 3, The Red Oak Shield Virus, Corey Kenshin, Pothead Holmes, Rival 1, Jimbo the Hutt, Caspian, Jordan Nels, The Village Witch, Hades Nephew, Jordan Wayne Deckart, Bradley Lipe, Ann Charan, Acid System, Mike Bullock, Fooly Cooly Dude, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation, Brian Arse, Cryptic Nightmares, Shadow Morningstar, Brianna Wright, Someone You Love, Said the King 56, Bad Honey, S Man, Kiri the Sloth, Thomas Burgett, Liam Newman, Sky Harbor, Caleb Dougal, Last Blade Song, Rafael Rodriguez, The Ginger Bros, and Aaron Stormcrow. And another thank you to all you guys who are in the description down below. Thank you guys so much for watching. Thank you all for listening. And I hope you all have a wonderfully happy Halloween. Sweet dreams. <laughs>